Um, I am Maya Van Rossum, the Delaware Riverkeeper. Um, my organization is the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And we work throughout the entire Delaware River watershed, which includes portions of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, to champion the rights of communities to a Delaware River and tributary streams that are free-flowing, clean, healthy, and abundant with a diversity of life. But today, I'm not going to be here to talk about the Delaware River. I am here to talk more broadly about our environmental rights as people here on this earth. No matter what your age, I think throughout your entire life, you have heard about the important rights that we all hold dear. The right to freedom of speech, the right to freedom of the press, the right to freedom of religion. Um, we've heard about our right to trial by jury and about the importance of our private property rights. <clears throat> but um, as we have grown, what we do not hear about is our rights to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment. We don't hear that we as people here on this earth have the right to a healthy environment. And that's because em environmental provisions are rare and not usually not very strong when they are in our state constitutions. And because our environment has not been given that same high level of constitutional protection as those other political rights that we all hear about, like the freedom of speech, industry, politicians, um, and others have been allowed to take advantage of our environment, to introduce pollution into our environment, to pollute the air, to pollute the water, to pollute the soils, and as a result, to pollute our bodies, to pollute and damage our communities. But it's time that we need to change that. We need to give environmental protection the same highest level of protection as all the other political rights that we hold dear. A very important step in that direction has been taken, is being taken, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And so Jordan and I are here this morning to talk to you about where we stand in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania when it comes to constitutional environmental rights, but even more importantly, to talk about where we go next here in Pennsylvania and beyond the boundaries of Pennsylvania to really advance this fundamentally important issue of environmental rights, our rights to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment. And so I want to start a little bit with the story of Pennsylvania and how we came to this, this point. Um, unfortunately, Pennsylvania's history is rich with stories of environmental degradation. Almost immediately, the logging industry came into this beautifully very forested state and started to denude it. And by some reports, as much as 90% of the forests were cut in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I think we are all aware of how much damage the coal industry has done to Pennsylvania, spewing pollution into the air, into the water, into people's bodies, surrounding communities with piles that just despoiled the environment and the quality of life in those communities. Not only were the trees over harvested, and over harvested and taken advantage of, but species of all kinds were taken um, and over harvested and were taken to the brink of extinction or actually right over that line into extinction here in the Commonwealth and beyond. Wetlands, wetlands that are so fundamentally important to all of us in so many ways were not given the respect and the care and the courtesy that they, and the protection that they needed and that we needed them to have, but wetlands were viewed as something to, to be filled in, to be built upon, to be set aside, to be despoiled like so many other things. Um, Pollution was spewed into the air. Pollution was spewed into the water by an industry. This was done legally, this was done illegally. The um, reports of fish kills and people suffering in terms of their health became just a regular part of the landscape in terms of the news and the understandings of peoples and populations here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, in the Delaware River, pollution was so severe that there was a 20-mile oxygen dead zone, totally devoid of life for 20 miles, top to bottom, bank to bank in our main stem Delaware River because of the serious contamination pollution levels. People who would come to the docks of the, of the Delaware and other rivers would uh, come into contact with such serious 
levels of pollution, such serious contaminants that they would become sick and sometimes they would even die. And I think it was just broadly recognized that while we had all of these um, important natural resources all around us, the benefits of these natural resources, the benefits of the water, the air, the soil, the plants, the animals were being denied us because of this high level of pol pollution and overharvesting and damage and denigration that had been allowed to happen here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And then in 1970, wonderfully, a legislator named Franklin Curry came to office. And he saw all of that damage and he saw how wrong it was. And he saw how people in Pennsylvania were being denied their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness because they didn't have the benefit and the values that were provided by clean and healthy and natural resources. And he decided it was time to change that. And he recognized that one of the reasons why this devastation was allowed to happen was because, in fact, our healthy environment was not protected at the highest legal levels in Pennsylvania's constitution, like all those other political rights that we talked about. And he recognized that it was time to change that. And he realized that we were at a moment in time here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania where there had been so much environmental harm. People were so damaged by this devastation and so sickened by it, literally, physically, but also mentally, psychologically. He recognized that, that it was a critical moment and that people were ready for change. And he put forth a constitutional provision, constitutional language, that eventually became Article I, Section 27 of Pennsylvania's Constitution that promised everybody in Pennsylvania the right to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment. And he advanced that provision uh, but through the state legislature. And when that provision and, and its beautiful language went before the House, it was passed unanimously. And when it went before the Senate, it was passed unanimously. And when it went before the people, it was passed overwhelmingly by a vote of four to one. And so in 1971, our rights to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment received the highest level of legal protection that you could get in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And everybody believed that we had hit a point in time where things were going to change. Finally, our environment was going to receive that level of protection that it, that, that it needed so fundamentally, that we needed it to have in order to survive and in order to thrive. But sadly, that was not to be the case. For literally 42 years, from when that provision was passed until 2013, when Jordan so beautifully argued this provision before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court and won, to, won for us a fundamentally important victory, this provision lay pretty much dormant. Now, there were other laws that were passed at the state level and the federal level that advanced environmental protection, but they didn't give that same highest level of protection that our environment in Pennsylvania would have received had the Pennsylvania constitutional provision, Article I, Section, Article 1, Section 27, been honored and been applied properly. And so pollution and damage continued. Then come to the mid 2000s. Um, what would happen, by the way, during those 42 years, and I think probably many in, of you in, in this room experienced this, I experienced this, that you would go before some legislative body, some government uh, official, whether it would be at the municipal level, the state level, and you would be challenging some sort of environmental threat, some sort of industrial permit or operation that was going to move into a town, and you would talk about the importance of environmental protection, and even quote Article 1, Section 27. And the, the, whatever those decision-making officials before you would do very often is they would sit back and they would roll their eyes, and they would sigh, and they would fold their arms. Some of them would chuckle. And eventually, you would get the, the remark, the response, that Article, Section 20, Article 1, Section 27 was merely a policy statement, that it didn't really have substantive force and effect in the law, and therefore that it could be ignored. And they would go on and make whatever decision it is they were going to make, regardless of the important language in that constitutional provision. And then the mid-2000s came, and shale gas extraction came knocking on the door of Pennsylvania. 
and shale gas extraction was allowed to proliferate, a highly industrial operation that creates pollution and environmental devastation and community harm from start to finish. It uses um, high industrial equipment burning fossil fuels that spew contamination into the air and cause 24-7 light and noise for those who live around it, whether they're human populations or non-human populations. Land had to be cleared, has to be cleared, for shale gas extraction, for the drilling pads, for the roads, for the infrastructure. Massive volumes of water was being taken from our, our streams, from our creeks, from our rivers, from our groundwater supplies in order to fuel the industrial operations associated with drilling and fracking, which is essentially a process designed to shatter the geology of the earth in order to release little bubbles of natural gas because we have to get every bubble of gas out of the earth if we're to continue our sort of fossil fuel path forward. The, the amounts of water that, that were required, that are required by shale gas extraction are phenomenal. Five million gallons of water for every well drilled. To that water, 25,000 to 100,000 gallons of chemicals, often toxic chemicals, added. Chemicals that are known to cause, to have serious health hazards on those who come into contact with it. As the drilling and fracking process moves forward, all the water that, that is used as part of that process to which we have intentionally allowed the industry to add toxic contamination, it gets further contaminated by the heavy metals, by the salts, by the benzene, by the toluene, by the naturally occurring radioactive materials in the geology. And that water becomes further toxified just by virtue of that drilling and fracking process. In Pennsylvania, um, at this point, there have been nearly 9,000 wells drilled, but the industry, as we hear it, would like to drill 100,000 wells. And yet we already have such incredible devastation. Take 9,000 wells, multiply it by 5 million gallons of water, multiply it by the 25,000 to 100,000 gallons of intentionally added toxic chemicals, and you, have a, you can see that we have a very serious situation here. Most of the water in the drilling and the fracking process um, remains under the surface of the earth. So that highly toxic water remains underground. And some people say, well, that's a good thing. Well, I say that's a bad thing because I think we all learn from the very earliest years of our education that we have a limited supply of fresh water on the surface of the earth to sustain us. So do we really want to be giving it to a single industry to toxify and lock away underground? So the, the, the water that gets used, that 80 plus percent that gets locked away underground as part of the drilling and fracking process um, is not a good thing, no matter how you look at it. Uh, but, it but of the 10 to 20 percent that comes back to the surface of the earth because of the intentionally added toxins and the geologically added toxins by virtue of the process that comes back to the earth is so highly toxic that the industry doesn't really have many good options for what to do with it. Um, and so they tend to store it in, in pits for periods of time to reuse it in the drilling process. But most of it, most of this over 1 billion gallons a year that gets created by the industry, and remember that's only with those 9,000 wells, um, gets taken to other states that allows the industry to inject it intentionally under the earth to be somehow locked in the geology. Once again, not a good solution because we lose the, the, that water to support and sustain us into the future. People as the result of drilling and fracking in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania when shale gas extraction came knocking at our door started to lose the quality of the water in their homes. They couldn't get a clean, healthy, safe glass of water from the faucet. They couldn't safely bathe their young children in the bathtubs in their homes. It was a serious, it is a serious and growing situation. Pollution was being emitted into the air, impacting um, people's health and the quality of their lives. Much of the pollution spewed by the shale extraction, gas, uh, shale extraction process is, of course, methane. Methane is a very serious uh, climate changing emission. And so by virtue of allowing this shale gas extraction to continue, we, we have been, we are exacerbating climate change. 
intentional pollution was happening every day because of shale gas extraction, but you also had incidents and accidents outside of the boundaries of the laws, some intentional, some unintentional, that were cur uh, uh, causing further degradation and harm to our environment and to our communities. The infrastructure started to be built to sustain the shale gas extraction industry, and our forests were being cut down, are being cut down, our streams were and are being cut through, our wetlands are and continue to be built over and devastated. Um, the environmental harm, the level of community harm that was being allowed to happen was serious and was significant. And communities were finding themselves, homeowners were finding themselves, do find themselves just surrounded by this industrial operation. And you can, if you look in that picture with all of the, the wells and the fracking pads and the processing plants and the compressor stations and all the, the, the harmful parts of the shale gas extraction industry, you will see a home. You will see a homeowner. That homeowner may or may not have consented to that industry happening so close to their home. But either way, they're probably not happy campers. And despite that the shale gas extraction industry was allowed to so easily, so quickly inflict so much harm on so many here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, it just wasn't enough for them. And they went to state legislators and they asked for a piece of legislation called Act 13 that would make it even easier for them to drill even more and inflict more harm on our communities and on our environment in order to enhance their bottom line, their industrial, their corporate profits. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan to continue the story. Um, so the story uh, continues with what Act 13 did, and this is just a brief outline of where, uh, where I'll be going. But my, my already showed this language, um, and I think it's worth spending a little bit more time on, and we'll come back to it at the end. Um, but, you know, as a, as a lawyer, um, as, a, as an activist, we, we look to the Constitution, we say, well, that's the language that should mean something. Um, and that's the language that everybody is supposed to respect. Um, and to then see such powerful language that states what our rights are so clearly, and that fits it into um, a declaration of rights where our other core political rights are set forth, and then to see it ignored um, is very frustrating. Right? I mean, it's like, how can that be there and, have, and, and just really have it ignored and have it not be given meaning? Um, and so when Act 13 came along, um, we'll talk about kind of how, how the response came about. Um, but picture yourselves as you're thinking about these challenges with that language in Section 27 in the background, um, because as we uh, as we've lived through this, we always have to remember that that's been in our background, and and the story now is that it's it's now in our foreground, and we have to figure out how to make the most of that. So what Act 13 did was, in short, it required every municipality in the Commonwealth to allow uh, oil and gas development and related activities, uh, impoundment pits, compressor stations, uh, natural gas processing facilities. Uh, divided them up slightly, the, um, but the core components of natural gas development were required to be allowed in every municipality and in every zoning district within every municipality. It established um, minimum setbacks um, for where those could go, but the ultimate point was wherever you were, whatever your local officials wanted to do, uh, they had to take this industry and give it special treatment. And so what we understand generally through, uh, through zoning law is that through zoning, municipalities um, get to decide where you're going to put compatible and incompatible land uses. And so you ask a question, is this land use, it's a game you might play with a kindergartner, is this land use uh, more like A, B, or C? Um, so that's, everybody recognize what that is? And this was, my daughter helped me with this when she was in fifth grade and could do PowerPoint much better than I could. Is, it, is that more like a house, more like a farm, or more like a factory? And that's what we do as land planners in municipalities. It's what zoning officials do. 
is they look at each use and they say, which is it more like? And we're going to put it with compatible uses and we're going to keep it away from incompatible uses. So you don't put a factory next to a school. You don't put it next to a hospital. You don't put it next to a senior living center. You don't put it next to preschools. You use zoning in your community to keep industrial activities away from fragile populations. You use zoning to keep industrial activity away from your fragile natural resources. So if you've got a primary aquifer in your community or you've got high quality or exceptional value streams or key wetlands, you're not going to zone so that you've got this industrial activity there. You're going you're to put it in a, in a safer place. Uh, that's what municipalities um, used to do. Um, and then Act 13 tried to take that away for the oil and gas industry um, and required municipalities with oil and gas operations broadly defined, required municipalities to, require, to um, allow this industrial activity in every zoning district. So if you've got a zoning district that's an open space zone where you've got your fragile wetlands, you've got wooded area you want to protect, um, you've got to now allow, under Act 13, you would have now had to allow gas drilling there. You've got a river corridor and you try to keep development out of your river corridor, you'd have to allow it there. Permitted by, so drilling and, and fracking, uh, well site construction by right in every zoning district. Um, impoundments permitted by right in every zoning district. Compressor stations permitted by right in agricultural and industrial districts and conditional use in all other. Conditional use simply means it's a permitted use, but you got to go through a hearing before the, the governing board. The governing board doesn't have discretion to deny it if it meets the basic elements of the, of the ordinance. Um, uh, with Maya um, taking the, the lead and with uh, seven municipalities, including two in Bucks County, uh, Nakamix and Township in Upper Bucks, outside of the Marcellus Shale region, but targeted for drilling um, 300 leases signed um, in northern Bucks County uh, by, um, by some of the industry who's, who's looking everywhere that they can, outliers, uh, got together with a group of municipalities really in the middle of it in the western part of the state. Um, and Dr. Khan, who's a physician um, who was most concerned about that portion of Act 13 that we refer to as the physician gag rule, um, which allowed disclosure of, of confidential uh, chemical information to physicians, but they couldn't then disclose it further. So they couldn't tell their patients about it. They, uh, under a strict reading of law, they couldn't put that information in the records. They couldn't confer with toxicologists. This was an industry law. Um, so we got together and said, well, what are we going to do about this? Um, and, you know, you start with the basics, right? You should start with the Constitution. Um, and we went up to the Commonwealth Court, and I had colleagues from the western part of the state, a uh, tremendous uh, legal team with, uh, with, with wonderful colleagues from the western part of the state. Uh, John Smith, uh, one of my colleagues, crafted an argument uh, that, that Article 1, that um, Act 13 violated Article 1, Section 1 of the Pennsylvania Constitution, which is our property rights. That zoning is about the protection of property rights, and that for zoning to be lawful, it has to be rational, and that if you insert all this industrial activity into residential districts, into areas that aren't zoned for residential activity, it, it loses its rational basis, and therefore that zoning is unconstitutional. The Commonwealth Court agreed with that, and the Commonwealth Court didn't want to have anything to do uh, with the argument uh, that I had brought to the table, which is that uh, Act 13 violates Article 1, Section 27. Uh, what we were saying was that by requiring all these municipalities to pass uh, these ordinances that allow drilling everywhere, the municipalities are agents of the Commonwealth, and the courts have previously said that when we talk about Commonwealth in Section 27, those responsibilities of the Commonwealth, they are shared by all branches of government, including municipalities. And so the way municipalities, one of the ways municipalities carry out their constitutional duties is through zoning. And if you're going to require municipalities to eliminate that protections, you're requiring those municipal officials to violate the Constitution, and you can't do that. That was basically our argument. Commonwealth Court didn't think much of that. Um, we got to the Supreme Court, um, and um, in a 160-page decision on December 19, 2013, uh, the Supreme Court agreed that Act 13 violates Article 1, Section 27 of the State Constitution. And it's the first time that the court has ever used Section 27 to declare a law unconstitutional. 
Um, and so I want to just walk through some of what the Supreme Court found, some of what the Supreme Court focused on. Um, I will caution you that the portion of the decision that there was a majority decision that said Act 13 was unconstitutional. Three of the justices found it was unconstitutional under Section 27, and one of the justices in the majority uh, adopted the reasoning of the Commonwealth Court that it's a violation of the, of the, of the property rights. Um, and so how this gets played out uh, going forward is still, uh, still being debated. Um, but the, the plurality decision looked at the constitutional text. And, uh, and so I have argued that this decision is a model of conservative jurisprudence. Uh, that we are going to be purists and look purely at the language of the Constitution and interpret that language. Strict constructionists of the Constitution. Um, and we're also going to recognize that, that small government is good. That we don't have to trust large central government in Harrisburg, that we should trust local democracy in municipalities. So the Supreme Court found that the citizens, and noted that the citizens construe the Environmental Rights Amendment as protecting individual rights and devolving duties among all actors in the government. And that if they're to have meaning, they have to be actionable. You have to be able to hold a government actor accountable for violating those rights. The other side said, this, these are people who are just upset about the policy. They just don't like shale drilling. And, and they're just upset about the policy judgments that the legislature gets to make. Those are legislative political decisions. The court shouldn't have anything to do with it. That was the other side's argument. Um, and the court said, it's not just about that. It's about our core constitutional rights. And that unless the Declaration of Rights is to have no meaning, the citizens must be correct. So there's a recognition by the court that it matters, when we, when we look at the Constitution, it matters where those rights are stated. And by putting Article I, Section 27 in the Declaration of Rights, that meant that they are inherent and indefeasible rights, and that they are on par with our other political rights, as Maya listed at the beginning, the right to free speech, the property rights we all enjoy, our right to bear arms. Those are all, all recognized as fundamental rights. And any action of the government that challenges those fundamental rights is going to be subject to strict scrutiny. Any action of government that challenges our rights to clean environment likewise has to be subject to that same strict scrutiny. And so the court noted that this whole concept here is premised on that part of our charter, the charter being the Constitution, that guarantees these rights and that puts the duty on government to protect those rights and to protect those values into the future. Because it's not simply a statement of a right to a clean environment. It's also a statement that the Commonwealth has a duty. It's a trustee relationship. The Commonwealth has a duty to maintain and protect uh, those features of the environment, our shared public natural resources, not just for us today, but for future generations. The court really enjoyed referring to um, the, the, the municipalities, the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and Maya as the citizens. And so all the language is the citizens, the citizens, the citizens. Um, and, the, um, and so the, the court recognized that that the, the people who were challenging Act 13 were the same people who had ratified uh, Article 1, Section 27, that overwhelming majority of the Pennsylvania population that recognized these rights as inherent. The Declaration of Rights assumes that the rights of the people articulated in that section of the Constitution um, are inherent in all of us. So we don't have those rights because they're placed there. It's by reading them there, we know that we have them. Does that make sense? They are inherent, and they show up there because they're inherent. But they exist regardless, and it's their placement there that lets us all know that. So it's not a historic accident that we have these rights, and there's a recognition in the decision of that long history that Maya discussed of the, the degradation of the environment. And there's a recognition there, too, that in the court that we can't look at, the, uh, at our environment from a statewide set of standards. That in order to understand what it takes to protect the environment, you have to look at the local level. And that local considerations matter. So the notion that you could have a statewide rule that says a uh, 500 foot setback from a stream 
is, um, is sufficient, ignores the reality that what goes on in a, at, at the very local level matters. And that, that may be sufficient in one place, but if you've got unique features here or unique resources here, those have to be respected. And so there's a recognition by the court that the protection of environmental values is a quintessential local issue that must be tailored to local conditions. Um, and so that's going to have an impact on all of us going forward as we talk to our local legislators and as we talk to agencies like, uh, like DEP uh, to say you can't just look at these regulations that you have that are setting statewide standards. You have to apply what you're doing to the local conditions and take those local conditions into effect. Um, and so this is just more language from the decision that, that drives home that point um, it, and recognizes that there is a, a local role to play. So municipalities in the state have generally deferred to DEP, have generally deferred to the statewide level for environmental protection. And there is a, a recognition in our Constitution, in the constitutional text, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, that they have a role to play, that the local communities have a role to play in protecting the environment. Um, further, it's not just a policy statement that we have a right to hold government accountable if those rights are violated. Um, that is, and when we, th when we think of that, when we think of that in the same context that we think of our other core political rights, that is a game changer. If we all start to accept that our right to a clean environment is as sacred and we can hold our government accountable for violating it, just like we can hold our government accountable for violating our free speech rights. It is a mind shift change that, that all, everybody who cares about the environment um, needs to fully embrace and that we need to constantly remind our government officials of. The other part of this that the court understood was that this is not simply a grant of rights but that it's a limitation on what government does. And so that means if you've got an agency of government that, that passes a, an ordinance, passes a law, when it does that, it's limited by the Constitution. So just like you couldn't pass a law that would deprive someone of their property rights or that would deprive them of their free speech or their gun rights, you can't pass a law that's going to cause an unreasonable degradation of the environment. You can't pass an ordinance that would do that. It also applies throughout the permitting decision. So we've always looked at regulations, we've always looked at at these standards that come out of the regulatory agencies. But there's also a constitutional standard because no government agency can take an action that would cause um, a, de a degradation of those environmental rights. So the Commonwealth and each of its agencies has an obligation to refrain from performing its trustee duties unreasonably, whether through executive action uh, or um, legislative action. The corollary of the people's Section 27 reservation of right to an environment of quality is an obligation on the government, on the government's behalf, to refrain from unduly infringing upon or violating the right, including by legislative enactment or executive action. And so every action of government is subject to that scrutiny. This, and there's a, I th a, lot of, uh, a lot of people who have invested a lot of their time in, in science here and who understand that if we want to protect ourselves, we need to understand what's really going on in, in the environment um, and we need to educate people about that. Part of what this decision does is says that we're entitled to science-based decision making. And so in order for the government to carry out its duties as trustee, um, it, it acts like any fiduciary would. And, under, and so we look to the law of trust. We look to fiduciary obligations. And if you serve as trustee over somebody's bank account, you can't make investment decisions that you haven't um, investigated what the ramifications of those decisions would be. That you have to be sure that the action that you're taking is going to protect that, that, the body of that trust, those resources that you are trustee over. The same is true with the environment. All government officials serve as trustee of our environment. And so they can only make decisions if the science supports that it will not cause an unreasonable degradation of the environment. 
and that in doing that, we don't just look about whether it'll cause an unreasonable degradation now, but we have to look at whether it'll cause an unreasonable degradation for future generations. And to do that, we don't just look at this one piece of the project. We have to look at cumulative impacts. We have to look, if you're gonna, if you're gonna put this well there, we don't just look at, at what impact that well is gonna have, right? Because when you put a well there, you gotta have the gathering line that goes with it. You gotta have the, the gathering line that takes you to a compressor station. So you gotta consider how are we gonna be impacted by having that pipeline there? How are we gonna Im be impacted by having a compressor station that goes in? How are we gonna be impacted then by having the natural gas processing facility that's gonna be required uh, to change that, that gas into a product? And then the transmission lines that come out of that. Um, that's the kind of science-based decision making that is required if we are going to uphold the promise of Article 1, Section 27, and if we're going to take our constitutional rights seriously. Now, I've been using all this in the context of gas drilling because that's the case that this came about in. But this is not a gas drilling case. This is a constitutional rights case. And those constitutional rights apply across the board for all activities of, uh, of, of humans that jeopardizes those rights that we all share. And it's a, it's a constitutional provision that has application without regard to what the nature of that operation is. It's a constitutional obligation that binds legislators, that binds local officials, that binds people who are making decisions about leasing of our state lands, uh, that binds people who are making decisions about what permits to grant uh, across the board um, in, in whatever capacities, whatever kind of projects they're dealing with. Um, and so with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Maya um, and we'll <coughs> talk about how we, how we carry this further. Thank you. Okay, so the question now really is what's next? So in December of 2013, we've got this phenomenal legal decision, <clears throat> but how do we make sure that th we don't lose the incredible progress we have now just achieved? Um, so we have to be thinking about what next. It is very important that we think about the next steps, that we really fully embrace what the court told us. Our right to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment is an inherent and indefeasible right that we all have as people by virtue of the fact that we are here on the surface of the earth. This is not a right that was granted to us by the Constitution of, of uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. This is a right that we have that is simply now clearly protected by, the, by Article 1, Section 27 of the, Constitutional, uh, of the Constitution of Pennsylvania. And that this is a right that doesn't just belong to all of us who are here today, but that this is a right that belongs to and therefore must be protected for all the generations yet to come. We need to understand not just that this is our right that we hold, hopefully hold dear, but that this is a right we must expect every government official at every level of government here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to honor, respect, and protect. So here in Pennsylvania, what's next, as Jordan said, really is making sure that our government officials uh, in Pennsylvania understand what their obligation is under Article 1, Section 27, what the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision means for them and for their everyday decision making. And one of the things that um, we have as part of a new project that the Delaware Riverkeeper Network has started called For the Generations um, includes a document that, that answers frequently asked questions for government officials about how they are to carry forward this Supreme Court decision. You can find it on our website. Um, a link to that website is at forthegenerations.org. But this is something we should be getting into the hands of every government official at every level of government, and frankly, to, in the hands of every resident of Pennsylvania. So when you go forth seeking environmental protection in your community, you know exactly what to demand and what to expect. We need to really fully understand, make sure we understand, make sure that our decision makers understand that as Jordan said, this decision came out of a court challenge to Act 13, which was focused on shale gas extraction, but Article 1, Section 27 and the Supreme Court ruling apply to every single threat to the environment in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And we have to understand it and we have to apply it that way. 
I, I can't stress enough the generational component. And one of the reasons why the generational component is so important is it really is one thing to protect a body of water for those of us who are here today. But it is quite another to make sure that all of the decisions that we are making will protect those water resources, those air resources, those soil, land, forest, wetland, animal resources for the generations. That too is a different way of thinking and, and really raises the bar on the level of environmental protection that must result from every decision that is made. We need to make sure that our government officials know that we understand, we all have, um, we as a community have a lot of priorities. Education, healthcare, family values, um, uh, recreational, recreation, uh, the quality of our lives, jobs, the economy. We have a whole host, historic values, artistic values, a whole host of values that we want to achieve, that we want to protect. But while our government officials are seeking to advance decisions that accomplish all those other goals and values that we have as a community, they must do so that in a way that at the same time protects our environment, for us and for future generations. And I would say to you that on a community level, it can always be achieved. There is never a path that cannot accomplish the other goal and protect the environment at the same time. You just have to be creative and smart in how you approach it. The other thing though, so we have this wonderful victory here in Pennsylvania and that's terrific and we need to continue to advance it and we are continuing to advance it at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and Jordan is continuing to pursue important legal actions for us to advance it. But you know what, Pennsylvania needs to be an inspiration for other states. Right? It is not enough that we have this high level constitutional protection here in Pennsylvania, but we really want to protect the country. We really want to protect the world. And so we need to go out to our friends, to our neighbors, who are not here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and we need to tell them the story about what has happened here. And we need to inspire them to go out and get their own constitutional provisions that will give this same highest level of protection to our environment. Because only by achieving that highest level of protection in every state in the nation, even at the federal level, and frankly, in every country in the world, are we truly going to protect ourselves and all the future generations yet to come. And so, and so one of the other things that we've done as part of the For the Generations project is we are taking a look at what is happening in the other states in the nation. And what we have found is that there are 15 states across um, the United States, across the nation, that have no constitutional environmental protection provisions whatsoever in them. So those states need to get something. Right? And in this document, you will see all those states identified. What you will also see identified are the 35 states that do have some language about the importance of protecting environmental rights, but very rarely does it reach that same high level of protection that we have here in Pennsylvania. I would say to you that only Montana has language that seems to rival what we have here in Pennsylvania. So all those other states, all those other states need better constitutional environmental protections in their constitutions if we are really going to achieve this highest level of protection nationwide. And so we need to inspire all the people who live in all of those other states to go forth and try to get a better constitutional provision in their state. Because even though they have language, it really does matter what that provision says, right? So for example, in Minnesota, they have a provision that talks about protecting hunting and fishing rights. They are very important environmental rights. We definitely want to protect them. But do we want to protect them to the exclusion of protecting our right to be able to, to breathe healthy air and to drink clean water? No. So there's a lot missing here in Minnesota. Other states have wonderful a lovely language about the importance of environmental protection but then when it comes down to it what they do is they say to the state legislature, now legislature, you have to pass laws to protect the environment. But that doesn't accomplish what Jordan was talking about, about making sure that it is very clear that the constitutional, uh, that the environmental rights are inherent and indefeasible. And if the government fails, you have a right to challenge and to hold those government officials accountable. 
So in fact, what these provisions do by, by acknowledging the importance of environmental protection, but then sort of putting it all on the shoulders and in the hands of the state legislature, they actually undermine the thought process that we all need to have in understanding that our environmental rights are in fact inherent and indefeasible and do belong to us and don't belong to the government. So we need to inspire those states to understand that and to do something better. Um, and I think just, I just want to take a moment, Jordan and I have put the language of the Pennsylvania provision up several times, but we haven't taken a moment with you to actually read that language. So now that we, we've sort of taken a moment to see what some other states say, let's see what Pennsylvania's constitution actually says. Let's look at this together. The people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people, including the generations yet to come. As trustees of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people. And I would say to you, we are so lucky to have this provision by virtue of Franklin Curry here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but we need to go forth and get provisions as strong as this and in the constitutions of every state in the nation. And I would suggest to you, we even want to get a provision like this in our federal constitution. And I believe that there is so much environmental harm that has been happening in so many states across the nation that everybody right now is in the moment that existed in 1971 for Pennsylvania, is in the moment when we can get our legislators and our citizens to pass these constitutional provisions. We just need to seize the moment. And we need to do it for ourselves, and we need to do it for the generations yet to come. We need to do it for the human generations and for the non-human generations that don't have a voice unless we give it to them. So I encourage you all to go to uh, the ForTheGenerations.org, learn more about this program, Jordan and I will go to any community group anywhere in this nation on our dime um, if it will help inspire them to rise up and get this highest level of constitutional protection in their state uh, constitutions. So if you know someone who you think could rise to that challenge, make sure they get in touch with us because Jordan and I will be on the next plane out there. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dennis Miranda, Executive Director for the Winston Hicken Valley Watershed Association. With nearly 30 years of conservation work, it seems like we're reviving the ethic and the legal realities of the 70s here in the 2000s. But beyond the landmark decision of December 19, 2013, every public jurisdiction that has to face people's rights will agree to infringe upon resulting in damages. Typically, the follow-up litigation results in natural resource damages as a monetary value for the damage done to an environment. Is there some legal decision or some expansion on the, on the landmark decision that demonstrates that the cost of impacting the environment against our rights has a dollar value? Is that something that this, this particular landmark decision results in? We haven't, uh, we haven't gotten to a anything that has said that at this point. Um, and the, in other contexts, the courts in Pennsylvania have said that there is no monetary claim for constitutional violations, unlike at the federal level. Um, so we're not there yet, and it's not clear from looking at how the law has been applied in other contexts that we're likely to be there anytime soon. Hi, I'm Dan Schaefer. I'm the president of the Tully Chapter Trout Unlimited. Uh, could you comment on how all this integrates with 1972 EPA Clean Water Act and waters of the United States, which is clarification, rulemaking, and so on. Because we, we, you, you talked about cross-border protection, and does waters of the United States actually enhance that possibility? Um, well, I think this, um, I think in some ways this goes, what, what we have in Pennsylvania under Section 27, um, it provides uh, greater weight to to Pennsylvania decision making um, because there is always a claim, there's always a recognition that whatever federal law is, that state law can provide greater protection for rights. Um, and so, and, and I think to, to your point that part of what that, uh, part of what the federal law 
uh, can do and part of what the Constitution can do, the Pennsylvania Constitution could do together is to say that when uh, what, what happens here affects what's going on in other states, such as the, the deep well injection that's being done, uh, that there is a basis under both the federal law and under state law uh, to hold uh, Pennsylvania decision makers accountable. Yeah, and so, so I would just add to that, right, that um, just because a facility in operation complies with the federal law, complies with the Clean Water Act, whatever mm -hmm. happens with WOTUS or not, right, that's a, a modification of the regulations, um, <laughs> that industrial operation, that decision making, that activity is still going to have to comply with Article 1, Section 27. So even if a facility or an operation gets a permit under federal law, if we deem it here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. as violating our, our in constitutional environmental rights, then we can bring a legal challenge. It can be a valid legal challenge, and it can be a legal challenge that will win and override the fact that that operation or that decision has a federal permit, right? So these are, these are important complementary laws, but they are also separate and distinct laws, and um, every government official in Pennsylvania has to comply with the Pennsylvania Constitution, and the, uh, the, a, a federal... Um, a federal law, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, any of those laws don't trump Pennsylvania's Constitution. So just because you comply with those laws, if you don't comply with Article 1, Section 27, uh, you can still, there can still be a legal challenge brought and won to stop that harmful operation. Right. The question I have is, should I be worried that Article 127, uh, Section 27, will now be revisited or modified or re- or something by that same group of uh, folks. It, 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 it would require to, to, it would require an amendment to the state constitution. Um, and to do that, you got to go through, got to go through two legislative sessions and you have to put it to a vote of the people. Um, just like it was enacted uh, through that process with a um, unanimous vote in the state legislature and with a four to one vote uh, by the populace, if we get to that point, uh, we're going to need all the people in this room to talk to all their friends to make sure uh, we're still there. Yeah. But, but, but that does, I mean, it does raise an important point. And whether we're talking about states that need to pr pass a new provision or pass an enhanced provision, or here in Pennsylvania or in Mon Montana, protecting the provision that's already in place, it will require the will of the people in every one of these states. So it is very vitally important that people, everyone, understand what has happened here and how important it is to them personally so that if that path were to you know if somebody were to start to embark upon that path we could quash it right away because we don't want to get engaged in that conversation and we don't need to if people understand the importance and the value of what has happened here and and, and just also we're there's still there is an ongoing battle for um for what it means and and how our government is going to treat it going forward um and we still have uh, a, a DEP um, in 2015 uh, that wants to um, that wants to minimize the impact of the decision and wants to minimize um, what its true role is um, under Section 27. And so it 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 does take vigilance um, uh, constantly uh, to continue to hold uh, those officials accountable. Hello, uh, my name is David Shogel, and I am a proud member of the Senior Environment Corps of the Center in the Park. Uh, quick comment and a question. Uh, quick comment is that, I, if my memory is correct, our new governor has uh, stopped uh, fracking in all public lands, um, in the state forests and, and so forth. Uh, that may or may not be correct. You may want to comment on that. My question, however, is, <coughs> What can we do to um, further the um, to further the, uh, uh, the protections for the environment on a national basis? Can we use a program such or a group such as MoveOn.org that has seven to nine million members, where you can post a petition online and? Uh, help get the word out uh, throughout the, uh, the, the federal uh, areas. Um, so I'll, I'll address the, the comment and then Maya will, uh, will address the question. The, um, the Corbett administration, um, Governor Corbett had issued an executive order 
in uh, last summer that um, would have allowed for additional leasing, additional leasing of uh, state parks and forests that are under the control of DCNR. Um, there had, there's, there was leasing that took place uh, already. It took place in, uh, also under the Rendell administration. Um, and then at, when Rendell was going out, uh, he put a stop to additional leasing right as he was leaving office. Um, uh, but there had been considerable leasing that was done. That drilling is continuing and, and, and we expect it to continue on, on state lands uh, through the Wolf administration. Uh, Governor Wolf issued uh, an executive order when he came into office that reversed a part of the Corbett executive order and restored the moratorium on additional leasing of state park and forest land um, under DCNR control, uh, but not all land under DCNR control. So DCNR uh, is continuing to sign leases uh, for uh, drilling under our waterways uh, that are controlled by DCNR. And there is other state land that continues to be subject to leasing, lands that are controlled um, under, the, uh, Fish and, under the Game Commission um, and, and other, other state-owned land that's outside of DCNR. And also the Bureau of Land Management is also getting in under the Act because apparently they own mineral, mineral rights under a number of the state game lands um, and they're now looking to lease those mineral rights to others for drilling outside the state game lands. That's a, that's a new discovery that we're acting upon so just be aware of that and, and pay attention to that as well. Um, but in terms of the, <clears throat> the federal action moving forward, um, I think strategically when it comes to talking about constitutional environmental rights, I think absolutely we have to have a constitutional provision in our federal constitution. We deserve it, um, it's the right thing to do and we should have it. Uh, but Part of this, the, the way to get there, I think, is to start movements in states across the nation. And if we are having this dialogue about the importance and power of constitutional environmental rights in states across the nation, it will rise up to the federal level of discussion. But frankly, I think we're going to have a, a, a lot more quicker advancement and progress if we go state by state by state and then allow the synergy of multi-state actions to sort of um, come together and uh, ad advance the dialogue at the federal level. But no matter what we're talking about, whether we're, you know, whether we're talking about this issue or other issues, all of those petition sites, all of those activities are important because they bring the importance and power of environmental protection to the forefront of everybody's minds and they give them an opportunity to do something concrete in response. So certainly a moveon.org petition for anything environmental, um, you would get support from us. I think in terms of a federal constitutional provision, we're not at that moment in time yet. We need to work through the states first and then we'll get there. Uh, Bob Adams, a uh, long time Riverkeeper member, urban <coughs> citizen. Um, I noticed, um, well, I, first thing, I, uh, Governor uh, Wolf, as one of his first acts, raised the severance tax to 5%, but which made me happy, and then he turned around and said, oh, but we're going to use that for education, which I found upsetting. And there was something in your presentation <laughs> should share in the benefits of these, you know, revenues uh, and, and the whole activity. I'm wondering if we could use that to require that at least some of that money be used to put back, put things back to where they should be from whatever damages this does. First off, um, you know, Bob has been a wonderful uh, environmental activist in Delaware Riverkeeper Network for decades, and he is a wonderful uh, restoration professional. So if you have any restoration to be done in your community, I highly encourage you to get in touch with Bob because he does great work and has done great work for us. Um, but in response to the question, you know, really the Delaware Riverkeeper Network does not have a position in support of the severance tax on shale gas extraction because what that ends up doing is it ends up creating new constituencies for shale gas extraction to move forward. And right now, I mean, that's politically what, what Governor Wolf is attempting to do, is by putting on, in place a severance tax to benefit education, he now has the whole education community behind him on supporting continuing shale gas extraction. And, you know, our position at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network is, you know, what good is a good education if you don't have your health, if you don't have the quality of your life, if you, you know, if you don't have a healthy environment in which to live, breathe, drink, uh, survive, and thrive. So um, we, we don't support the, the severance tax, and we think that it goes back to the point that I was making before, 
whatever is your objective. So if your objective is education as a politician, you should not be um, seeking to fulfill that objective or that goal by degrading, destroying our environment and the communities, therefore, that depend upon those environments. You should be finding a way to advance your educational goal that protects the environment at the same time. And there's plenty and plenty and plenty of research to show that a healthy environment actually helps nurture further and advance um, educational success of young people. So by protecting the environment, just by virtue of protecting the environment, you are enhancing and advancing your educational goals. Um, and I would suggest to you, by destroying the environment, you are destroying the lives of the kids that you're trying to educate. All the way around, it doesn't make any sense. So um, we are not supportive of, of this severance tax concept uh, because it really is being used to manipulate communities into supporting this devastating industrial operation that is hurting so many lives, so many families, so many people, and so many environments. How, how do we approach cumulative impacts and the 9,000 uh, wells or 100,000 wells uh, in that context? And that goes for any other uh, activity that might degrade the environment. Well, I, um, I think the, the short answer is, is by um, putting the science on. And so, you know, if we're involved, for example, in an in a, in a individual permit question, um, that as part of the analysis that DEP does, um, and if they fail to do it, part of the analysis that the Environmental Hearing Board needs to do is to consider all the science that, uh, that can be gathered um, on what the impact of that project would be. Um, and so let the science lead the way. Um, and the courts are able to, uh, to, to sort through the science in other contexts, and, and I'm confident that they can do it here. And we do it in the context of high quality and exceptional value watersheds. And, um, and in my mind, the constitutional standard um, is really a parallel standard to what we're used to doing in that context. Um, and, and so I think we can look to that existing body of law and the way it's applied uh, and say it ought to be applied more broadly. Do you want the last word, Maya? <laughs> I'm going to give it to her whether she wants to. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly, the only, the only last word I, I, I would like to say is that for the Generations um, Project, you know, we think is a very important, powerful project, um, advancing a very important and powerful concept that we started here in the Delaware River watershed, working with Jordan, um, we meaning the Delaware Riverkeeper Network and the Seven Towns and Dr. Khan. Um, and we really invite you to participate in this project, in this program. There is the website, but there is a Facebook page. Please do share it because we really believe we will advance our environmental rights here within the boundaries of the Delaware River watershed if we can envi in, um, in, enhance and move forward everybody's environmental rights in every watershed across the nation. So please help us build the collective, help us build the movement, help us spread the word, um, help us carry it forth here in Pennsylvania with the frequently asked questions, but also beyond the boundaries of Pennsylvania with the toolkit. Thank you. Thank you very much.